In this little video, we are going to take a quick look at Vue. What is Vue, you might ask? Well, it's a 3D tool by Eon Software, mainly used to create environments and landscapes, which, for example, makes it ideal for things like digital map painting. My name is Christian Hecker, and I'm using Vue for years now and was invited by ArtStation to talk a little bit about it. Vue comes in two different flavors, Vue Extreme and Vue Infinite for professionals and view complete studio as pre for hobbyists view extreme can be much like a plugin directly incorporated into the ui of bigger tools like 3ds max maya c4d and view infinite which is used for this video cannot be directly added into other 3d tools but is fully functional and allows to export your scene into all kinds of formats the complete studio and as pre versions for hobbyists do miss a couple of assets that are standard in the professional versions but for better oversight and information please check the website of eon software and that's eon dash no e dash on software dot com for more information on these hobbyist versions with its focus on environments and landscapes the only massive downside is there is no modeling in view at least not to a degree or in a way we know from other tools like 3ds max and c4d so if you're a concept artist uh, for environments or a digital matte painter to explain to you how Vue can be a great addition to your tool set, I picked the scene I recently finished and want to use it to walk you through the tool and my process a little bit. In order to show you around a bit, I picked a scene that is part of my Endeavors series and combines all the elements that I think make Vue such a cool tool. It allows you to create some fantastic environments and landscapes. To show you around in view, I will guide you through the setup of my scene file for this project. While going through the several elements of the scene, I want to show you some of Vue's features like the terrain, ecosystem and atmosphere editors so you have a good overview of what these uh, things can do since these are crucial uh, for creating a cool and detailed scene in the end i hope you have a good overview of how view can be used and maybe a neat addition to your own arsenal last but not least i will give you a quick look into the photoshop file and how to use views multipass options to optimize your post work while Vue is indeed the main 3D software I used in this project, I did use a series of other 3D tools to help me out, mainly World Machine for some of the background terrains and DAS Studio for the uh, building models. Before we jump ahead into Vue, I want to show you some renders to visualize the geography and scale of the scene. What we can see here is the uh, final version of the scene that includes uh, Photoshop post work. Now the following renders do not contain post work and are just there to visualize uh, the geography of the scene. In this one you can see that the models are not very detailed and rather uh, low poly and not super crazy detailed. But you can see um, that the ecosystem that are the trees do have a nice uh, distribution and the trees are scattered rather rather nicely and very natural throughout the scene here we have a view from the other side again the buildings not super detailed but since we are uh, since we are seeing them from farther away the detail is pretty much enough Here we have a zoomed in top view that uh, gives a nice impression of the scale with our city right here with our camera somewhere around here. And here we have a zoomed out top view that contains the complete scene along with the mysterious background towers. Scale is very important to make the atmosphere and view work best. What are these towers you might ask? Well, 
I don't know yet, but have some ideas that may play out as I continue the series of pictures in the future. Now that we have a good impression of the geography of the scene, let's jump into view. Alright, now we are in view. Now to introduce you properly uh, to the tool and its setup, I want to guide you through the user interface a little bit. And let's start with the top bar. That's uh, the usual stuff we know from all the other tools and, and it's pretty much standard. Creating a new scene, loading a scene, the atmosphere editor, zoom buttons and the render buttons right here. Then on the left we have the um, tool buttons, a text tool, the terrain for adding terrains, then uh, adding trees and foliage. Then we have a rock tool, a tool for clouds, and we can even add some background planets, but these are just uh, bitmaps to be honest. And a path tool that's great for uh, creating roads or streets, for example. Then we can, of course, add um, custom objects, OBJ files, and DAE, and what have you, 3DS. Then a tool for a tool for adding a particle system, and a tool for uh, particle effector and all kinds of standard stuff. Um, as I mentioned um, before, there is no way of uh, modeling in view, but if you are creative, you can use the uh, text tool, for example, and in combination with um, Boolean operations, you can at least uh, do some basic stuff. I did some, some scenes in the past where I only used vectors and the uh, boolean operations along with the text tool and it worked pretty well even though I must admit that it was quite time consuming. Nonetheless there there are ways of, of basic modeling in view. Then on the right we have the uh, object aspect and object uh, windows or bars. If you activate an object, we have here the material object, uh, uh, material options. Um, double click right here and it opens the material editor along with all the materials that are assigned to this object at the ecosystem, which we will cover in a minute. Um, Next there on the right we have the options for uh, placing the objects and even distort it a little bit. Um, can be quite handy if we want to uh, adjust mountains with an overhang so it has a nice alien feel but it's a little tricky to use. Then we have normally we have a preview window of um, now where is it yeah normally I have a preview window here let me take a look um, yeah, normally I deactivate it to uh, save some resources but um, in a fresh install of you you uh, as a standard have this uh, preview rendering active and of course, the uh, user interface in general is uh, fully customizable and you can save uh, your customized uh, setup. So that's definitely a very cool thing. So let me deactivate this quick. All right. Then down here, we have the world browser and the world browser contains every object in your scene and every yeah, every camera, every atmosphere, and, and if there are clouds, you, you will find all this stuff right here. And we have uh, uh, four different tabs in this web browser. And in 
the second tab we have all uh, bitmap materials that are in the scene. In the third tab we have all materials in the scene. That includes procedural materials. And then the last tab is a summary of all master objects in the scene. So that's the uh, user interface. Let's go into the scene. Now to give you a, a, a quick overview of the scene, I will switch through the cameras I used for the uh, renders I showed you in the previous segment. Here we have the top view. First perspective, second perspective, and the far away top view. Let's go to the second perspective and again you can see that these buildings are not very high polygon and that the trees within this city or town are placed by hand can be a little tedious but um, it's worth it uh, just for the control over the scene and all the uh, trees that are uh, uh, included in ecosystems are uh, displayed by billboards to save resources. Of course you can go in and switch to a full display, full quality display, but uh, generally the billboard display is more than enough to work with. Let's take a quick look into the camera settings. Here we have another preview. Over here the film settings are um, a couple of filters that can change the look of your scene when it comes to the colors. Of course a expo exposure slider that comes with all kinds of photograph uh, photo settings. And we can of course add a backdrop. Um, in my experience it's best to use an HDR um, since uh, normal bitmap uh, JPEG or bitmap or TIFF sometimes create or sometimes when rendered uh, turn out a little too dark. Um, not entirely sure if they did something with it or fixed it or adjusted this but um, when you use uh, when you're working on a scene like much like I do sometimes uh, you create a foreground and a background separately in two different scenes and you want to render your foreground with the background as a backdrop to save render time for example you uh, can render your background with an HDR and put it in here for your foreground render and it should serve serve its purpose wonderfully I used it a couple of times and was able to save quite some render time with this technique. All right, let's move on. Here we have the sun. The sun comes with um, the usual lighting settings that we know from other tools as well. Volumetric lighting, different uh, ways of uh, calculating shadows, how strong the light shall be even though this is grayed out for the sun but, but when you go for a point light or, or, or a spotlight a usual light source um, this this option here will en enable you to um, define how far the the light spreads and an interesting tab the influence tab here you can define which objects are affected by uh, light sources Now let's go into the terrains. Now this is a big one since we have two different kinds of terrains. We have procedural terrains and we can use or create height field terrains, standard height field terrains. Now the difference is, let's open the 
terrain editor. The difference between these two is that the procedural terrains are uh, fractal calculated. And if we take a look right here, it's a very small terrain. But this uh, pixel ratio or, or these pixel dimensions don't affect the uh, procedural terrains since um, the whole terrain is calculated via a fractal. If we switch into the function graph, we can see these fractals. And the cool thing is that view um, calculates the detail depending on where your camera is. Now, when you have a standard um, high field terrain and you zoom in, you can see how the terrain becomes more and more soft and less detailed. But when you're going with a procedural terrain and you zoom in, the uh, fractal calculation will uh, heighten the uh, detail and everything will always be pretty much razor sharp and very detailed. So these procedural terrains definitely have some advantages. And Height field terrains, the standard height field terrains are very nice uh, for background stuff. If you're using, let's say, a terrain created with a World Machine, these are very great for uh, background terrains, l large, huge mountainscapes. And for uh, foreground detail, I would almost always recommend uh, procedural terrains. Now in this window, we have, uh, again, a series of options. Um, that allow us to manipulate the terrain, create different kinds of terrains. Now for the last two versions of you, I think if I remember right, we also have erosion options and not only for the uh, usual standard height field terrains, but also for the uh, procedural terrains. So this is a great addition uh, by Eon in the uh, recent versions. Here on top we can load uh, terrains, save terrains, uh, convert terrains, and go for different display methods. This one is great if you need some orientation where what in your scene is and can be very helpful, although it uh, can eat quite some resources if your scene is loaded with heavy objects. So let's turn this off again. Then a couple of different display methods. Everything that helps to uh, help you navigate through the scene. These two buttons are for standard height fields. Um, here you can uh, increase the uh, pixel dimensions for your standard height field. If you are importing a height field, let's say created with World Machine, that is like 4K, uh, that has 4K dimensions, it's good to scale this up first to uh, 4069 pixels and then import your terrain via this button right here. Um, since um, the terrain needs to have the uh, exact pixel dimensions of the terrain you want to import. Now here on the right we have a couple of brushes that help you to um, yeah, customize the terrain. And here an overview over the uh, fractal that drives the uh, terrain, the procedural terrain we currently have in front of us. Here we have a couple of effects that can help add some additional effects to your terrain. And last but not least we have this zones feature. This is interesting because this feature allows you to cut out a certain piece of the terrain and create a separate terrain from this, from this cutout. So it's a very versatile, um, very versatile editor for your terrains here. Let's take a look into the next folder. That's another procedural ground terrain. And the fill and background terrains is a mixture of procedural and standard height fields. Let's open a standard height field in the editor and let's have a look at what this looks like. 
this should be a terrain I created in World Machine. So yeah, this is an 8K terrain, so it is quite detailed. And you can see that this detail looks pretty neat when when looking from the distance, but as soon as we zoom in a little bit, you can see how it loses its detail. So for mid-ground or background stuff, um, this is pretty much fantastic, especially with the features that come with World Machine. Um, but like I said, all these erosion uh, uh, features here are now in view as well, so that it's, it's, it's definitely helpful to have this in view as well. So uh, we can adjust our terrains directly in view without the need to go into World Machine and switch back and forth. Of course, we could use the um, erosion features in view to further enhance the erosion on this terrain here as well. However, if we are working on 8K terrains in this uh, editor, it eats quite some performance and can make view slow down quite a bit. So if we are treating 8K terrains, it's good to turn on this feature since it scales down the, the resolution a bit, even though we have um, the objects of the scene included here, it definitely uh, reacts a little better. And that's the difference between the height fields and procedural terrains. As you can see, I did go a little crazy right here with the terrains, just because I wanted to fill the space in the background. Most of these uh, mountains also have an ecosystem, and let's take a look at that. Now, ecosystems can be done by hand by uh, using um, the paint feature. And here we can load in uh, some trees. Uh, most of these are shipped with view. And we can go into the scene and paint it uh, wherever we want to. Or we can go via the populate feature by adding a ecosystem directly into the material of an object. And we can regulate where the trees and the foliage grows by uh, altitude or slope constraints. So there is a lot of uh, freedom right here. Same goes for the overall density, and this can be um, mixed up with a variable density that uh, tells the ecosystem where to grow what in what size. Same goes for the scaling. This can be defined by a mask as well. And we can add a, let's, let's say, a master mask that defines where on the terrain what, uh, not what, uh, where, where on the terrain anything grows. So there we have a lot of freedom uh, uh, where to and how to place your uh, forests on these mountains. That's the background terrains. Now, the town right here is something uh, where I actually created a um, separate scene for to uh, kind of look at how to lay out this town. And I, I was sh I was fairly certain that I want didn't want it too big, just a small thing, just like a small colony uh, uh, town, and almost uh, almost a village size. Nonetheless, um, I decided uh, to add quite some detail around here, especially with these trees, all uh, placed by hand. Can be tedious, but. Um, definitely adds uh, a little more realism. Then we have a little town hall building right there. And let's switch the camera. And right here we have the, uh, let's say, spaceport with the um, spaceship right here. 
that's currently landing and some houses there in the back right here where uh, people live and some office buildings um, these bigger ones right there now how realistic is this i don't know but um, i think it it serves the purpose and uh, brings the idea across i think and we also have some uh, parked little shuttles or cars right there a little bit of uh, crazy detail since you almost pretty much don't see it when you switch back to the final camera you actually cannot see it very well now the roads are created with a feature that um, is a spline is the so-called spline feature in view this allows you to exactly create roads or streets or paths some even used it very creatively to create waterfalls for example so if you are creative with with what view gives you there there are a lot of stuff uh, a lot of things you can do with this now placing these was quite of quite a hassle but um, ultimately it helped me to lay out this uh, little town a bit and bring this whole thing together while doing this i kind of felt like in the old days when i was playing SimCity, <laughs> planting all these trees and and the road and and the buildings right there it, it was it was a little bit of a hassle but it was also a lot of fun to see the stuff come together the next thing are some uh, green areas in the scene let's switch the camera again these areas right here just to uh, loosen up the overall appearance of the city not everything uh, concrete but also some green areas <clears throat> then the overkill detail I just mentioned a lot of parked cars um, again I'm not sure how, how visible this stuff is in the final image but I added it nonetheless then the uh, placed trees and again these were placed by hand and we have a drop feature that uh, that enables us to uh, if we load a tree and it's not uh, really on the surface where we want it to be we can drop it to the ground sometimes uh, the path is blocked and it's not dropped properly but um, it can be helpful in certain situations so these are the trees and while we have these open let's take a quick look into the plant editor now these trees are all uh, trees that come with view this plant editor again enables us to save and load um, plants raise their polygon count even change their appearance to a certain degree by changing changing the seed then on the left here trunk branches we can change the length fall of gnarl etc of different subsets depending on how complex the tree is then on the right we have the option to change size of leaves and everything so very handy if you have a lot of trees in your scene and you want some variation just change the uh, seed right here and you have a different kind of tree then a quick look at the airport let's change the camera again Here we have some uh, standard light sources, even though they as well aren't very visible in the final image. Um, again, we can see that these uh, buildings are not very high polygon. And but still, um, even though uh, low poly buildings, 
in the render don't look very good, you can al always add some detail, additional detail in Photoshop later. Then let's switch back to the original perspective for the front trees. These were added to create a, um, a framing for the scene, a compositional um, choice. And then we have the monoliths right there. These were uh, create with, uh, created with Cinema 4D, very basic models. Just something to suggest um, some scale or to add some mystery to this image. Uh, what are these towers? What do these do? Do these belong to uh, the colony right here or is this something alien? And last but not least, we have two uh, little shadows sipping around, uh, shadows. Two uh, shuttles zipping around here, one here in the back and one here in the front. These you can definitely see in the final image, so these are <laughs> not a wasted detail in this case. And this concludes the uh, ingredients in this scene. Um, for the last two things, let's take a look at the atmosphere editor. The options right here handle all the lighting and atmosphere, sky, fog, haze, how the lighting of the sun is treated. We have three different objects. And the atmosphere uh, model. Now this scene was rendered with the photometric model. Um, this model gives you a more muted set of colors. A, you would you would say a more realistic photographic uh, appearance. Um, then we have the standard model. And this model is generally uh, a little bit more rich in colors. But um, depending on what you're doing, both of these are fantastic. So uh, photometric, not in all cases, is better than the uh, standard model. When it comes to the lighting model, I would almost always suggest to go for global radiosity um, for your render. It delivers the most accurate uh, details with uh, lights bouncing on and off uh, materials and, and objects and reflections, etc. Then clouds. I don't have clouds in this scene and I generally try to avoid clouds in, in my scenes since these uh, tend to have astronomical render times and can be very painful uh, very painful to render um, so I try to avoid them nonetheless um, these clouds in view are fantastic and can create some really cool cloudscapes and skies especially in combination with god rays so here we have the uh, settings for the sky, fog haze, and uh, the global lighting settings. If your render comes out with um, noisy lighting, uh, I can suggest to raise this number right here or even go higher. Some of these value fields allow you to enter higher values than what the slider gives you. Not all of these uh, uh, fields in, in all of these tabs, but some of these tabs allow you to go higher than the stuff they uh, the sliders give you. Then we can add wind to our uh, foliage and our trees. A lot, of, um, a lot of options for that right here. I must admit I have never really played with these options since I generally or only do still images and not animations. But from what I saw of these uh, wind uh, uh, simulations in view, they this stuff works really good and looks pretty pretty neat. Then we have an effects tab to add stars, rainbow, ice rings. I rarely use this, or I actually never use this, but um, depending on what you're doing, I can see how this stuff can be interesting. The last tab is for adding snow or rain to your scene. This is an interesting thing. I played around with it uh, in, in the past and it is very good in creating a very convincing rain or snow atmosphere. So if you want to create a very atmospheric dense um, scene, this stuff will def definitely help you. Of course, all these scenes, uh, uh, all these scenes, all these um, Atmosphere settings can be saved and loaded and, and all that. We also have um, we also have the option to load from 
a huge number of presets that ship with you. So all this stuff um, helps you to orientate yourself and allows you to create some really cool atmospheres with some fantastic effects. The last thing we want to take a look into is the render options. Now, right here, the preset render, render quality, these are presets for your final render. And um, we also have the option with the path tracer to uh, activate a physically based renderer, although this is still a little bit under construction. Um, and I personally, I admit, have never really used it, but it's there and can be used if you uh, if you need it. Then we have different kinds of uh, rendering methods, uh, internal, so view renders it itself. External is, again, uh, a render method to uh, let view render it, but without uh, a preview of the render. Then uh, network rendering, of course, if you if you have a render farm, this is uh, very cool stuff. And right here we can select what to render. So this is defined by what we are doing in the world browser. Now, if we click on this and this X appears, this won't be rendered. And same goes with the eye, if we um, remove the eye and make it invisible, we can adjust this uh, setting here so this stuff won't be rendered as well. And one more thing regarding the world browser. Um, it is definitely, if you're working on a heavy heavy scene, it's definitely suggest, suggest I, I would definitely suggest to go with uh, adding layers and put all this stuff into named layers. It will definitely help you to uh, uh, efficiently move around in your scene and if you have multiple objects that uh, you created via kit bashing for example it's good to group these objects all this can be done uh, in this world browser without any big problems and then back to the render options here we have the render quality here we can select if we want to render uh, reflections, transparency, shadows, uh, materials, all this uh, funny stuff. And if we deactivate this one, we get access to multipath rendering right here. And that's something I love to use because it enables you to render additional, what I call filters that will help you to adjust or post work your image in Photoshop and it allows you to create masks for uh, either your uh, layers or every single object in your scene and if that object contains an ecosystem you can also select only to create a mask for uh, the trees for example in that ecosystem. The ecosystems uh, can be also added not only to the terrains but to all kinds of objects. I could even uh, plant trees on these buildings and 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 rocks and you name it. You can you can really use these ecosystems to plant all kinds of objects, whatever you have. Then the material masks. Um, Again, like the objects, a method to uh, create masks for specific materials in your scene. And this concludes our little um, overview over uh, the features in View Infinite 2016. And I hope um, I was able to make you interested in this piece of software since it's pretty pretty neat and allows you to create uh, quickly create some some basic uh, layout for let's say a concept art scene you're working on you you don't have to always work as tedious or uh, as uh, detailed as this scene here it's it's like i said uh, to a point almost overkill but um it helps you to quickly lay out a scene, add some mountains right here, add quickly, quickly add an ecosystem to suggest some forests and place some trees as framing in the foreground and you almost have a decent composition in a rather quick time. 
And I've seen some concept artists use Vue uh, to their advantage in, in the past, and they were able to create some really neat stuff. So not only for super detailed stuff, but also for rough uh, concept art stuff, but also again for uh, digital matte painting, of course, um, you can add and create some really, really detailed stuff here. And with the uh, ability to import all kinds of objects with all kinds of detail, um, you can, even though the renderer in view isn't the most uh, quick and advanced renderer, you can still, with a little bit of help of uh, post work maybe, create some really photorealistic stuff. And if you are a really tech buff, uh, you can go in and create some photorealistic stuff with the view renderer as well, but it takes some time adjusting the materials and lighting, of course. So again, I hope you had some fun and uh, you learned something here. And let's jump into the Photoshop file. All right, now we are in the uh, Photoshop file of the scene. And what we see here is the plain render, uh, uh, the plain view render of the scene. So nothing added yet, no uh, no fixes and, and overpaints or uh, additional photo textures. But you can already see that we have an area right here that needs to be fixed. And um, some of the elements in the city look uh, not very, not very um, detailed and could add some additional elements. Let's have a look at this first layer and this is something while I turn it on and off so you can see this. This is something I regularly do when I have a, a part in a scene that I'm not happy with. I go in and do a do an area render of that part and um, View allows you to render uh, only a specific part in, 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 in the scene. So you can save time and don't have to render all of the image when you only want to render this part of the image. So very helpful stuff. And this right here I didn't like very much. I wanted it to be more, I don't know, I, I liked this shadow when I played around with it. I really enjoyed this shadow and wanted this instead of this. So I did an extra render for that. Then let's activate the filters. And the filters for me are uh, stuff like uh, indirect lighting, diffuse lighting, specular, reflections. You can see that there are a number of other stuffs uh, I, I rendered out, but uh, didn't find very useful in this case or in case of this scene. And all this stuff is rendered via the multipass options. And let's deactivate the indirect lighting and activate it again, deactivate and activate again. It makes the appearance uh, uh, of the atmosphere glow a little bit more and look a little bit more realistic, I think. Then, if we zoom in right here, I rendered out again an additional uh, area render for uh, adding some additional detail to these towers. In this case, it's a bump map to suggest more, just to suggest more detail in these towers. I think it, it works pretty good and I think it gives it almost an organic appearance. Then we go to the city and let's deactivate it again. You can see that the landed spacecraft or uh, ship is not in the uh, original final render. This is stuff, um, stuff I tend to go in and detail out a little bit in the scene. I tend to render in an additional render after I rendered the uh, complete image. So the ship is one element like that, as well as the details around here in this area. Let's deactivate it again for the first original final render and activate it again 
I also added a light source right here to reflect the light of the engines uh, of the ship. Let's take a look in that folder. And let's deactivate these elements. This is the town area render. Uh, I did the additional town area render to add some additional detail to the town and some additional details for the spaceport and the ship right here. You can see the, the borders of the original area render and some light, some soft light in this area then some flags or symbols. I'm not sure what this is. I would say it's the company or the organization that is leading this colony uh, project or this colonization project on this planet. Then again, a couple of filters. Shadow, specular, indirect lighting, atmosphere gain. Let's deactivate it and activate it again. It makes the overall appearance of the city a little bit brighter because we have a lot of uh, bright uh, concrete materials used here. So the light that comes in is reflected a little bit stronger and the addition of these filters makes it look a little bit better, I think. And here we have some additional detail for the landing spacecraft. Let's zoom out again. Here we have two uh, photo textures I was adding just to, to play around a little bit and it actually looks not too bad but in the end uh, you will see that uh, these uh, don't actually make much sense and some additional detail for the uh, mountains there in the back. Again, photo textures that were added in that area. Let's zoom in there. These don't have to be super detailed. Um, I mainly added them to suggest some additional uh, detail and variation in the material of the of the mountain and i think it works pretty good then we have uh, some overpaints and fixes for the scene smaller stuff um, mainly uh, some highlights for the buildings and some fixes in the uh, terrain then some additional trees within the city because um, when i was almost done with the scene i thought well the city itself or the town itself could need some additional trees there uh, just to loosen up the overall uh, appearance uh, of the city. And I think these additional trees do a nice job. Then one of the shuttles right there and another one back here. Then some additional uh, soft shadows, barely visible, uh, mainly in this area. And the sky with a photo texture and uh, some clouds. Like I said, uh, rendering uh, clouds in view can be a very painful experience. So I usually tend to go for uh, photo textures instead of rendering the clouds. And another fix. Uh, a very needed fix for this area back here where we have the border of a terrain and just uh, yeah using the stamp tool to fix that area then to add some life to the scene I added some lights to the city it may not look super realistic that all these lights are uh, 
on all the time but i still think uh, adding adding stuff like that um, helps to make uh, these things look more alive then some smoke for the uh, whoops for the landing procedure of this spacecraft i'm not entirely happy with uh, how this uh, turned out but um, decided to keep it that way and then the atmosphere and here i added a a glow for the side or for the right side where the uh, sun comes from mainly stuff to suggest a more photographic um, appearance in this image not sure if it works a hundred percent but um, i do think it's not wrong to have it in there then we have the uh, foreground trees to frame this city and these foreground trees of course make these added textures around here totally uh, obsolete but i think the decision to add these trees as a framing framing device uh, and uh, make this image appear as if we are looking down from one of these mountains uh, really helps to come uh, helps to helps the scene to come together really nicely Last but not least, some photo effects by adding some flares to the engine of the of the big spacecraft that's landing there. Now if we take a look at the final image, you can see that the colors have changed and that's something I don't do in Photoshop. I try to uh, create the scene as close as possible to what I have in mind within Photoshop but I usually tend to go as a last step into Lightroom to have a look at what uh, the colors what I can do for the overall atmosphere appearance and the colors uh, by treating this image like a photo and most of the time it's uh, I'm able to to really get some interesting cool results out of there since we have here a kind of evening, eveningish atmosphere now, and that uh, suits the progression of my series. This image here is a part of, and if we go back, it looks like almost um, high noon kind of appearance, even though we have some long shadows. The colors look very muted and and grayish. This, of course, could have been uh, uh, changed by adding uh, adjustment layers and uh, playing around with that stuff here. But I feel that um, Lightroom, to me, feels a little bit organic, a little bit more organic treating adjustments like this. And um, I'm fairly happy with what I can do with that uh, combination. As a last thing, um, something I missed are uh, the channels that were rendered out by using the multipass options in view. As you can see, these are pretty much pixel perfect and really help you to cut out stuff and replace stuff if needed, if you are rendering, um, if, you, if you need to render specific part, uh, parts of the scene a second time to adjust detail, etc., etc. So, these multipass options are very handy and a total lifesaver in, in some situations. And this pretty much concludes my walkthrough through the uh, Photoshop file. I hope you, much like in the view segment, learned something and I was able to convince you to risk a look into view and uh, play around with it. And maybe in the future there will be uh, a chance to talk about more specific stuff instead of going roughly over these uh, different elements i hope to see you again next time until then have a good time and have fun